Welcome back to the long-awaited next chapter in the Fart History series. I have neglected you guys for a long time with this and I do apologize about that. <laughs> so for this subject, I wanted to pick something that was kind of spooky kooky ooky because we're around Halloween time. If I get this video out on time, we'll see. And I wanted to pick something that is very relevant and spooky because I find myself on YouTube when there are video essays, I find myself clicking on the ones that are like, that's kind of spooky. So thought I'd do that. The question today is why did Goya paint so many creepy figures? Why so many goats and witches and skeletons and deformed babies? Why did he do that? <laughs> do you think? Well, I'm here today to answer that question. So let me start off with a few disclaimers because you, you bitches, I love you bitches, but y'all are some bitches sometimes. I am not an art historian. I know I look exactly like one, but I'm not, okay? <laughs> I'm not an art historian. This is not anything that you should base any research or essays or anything related to academia on. This is purely me as an art history lover sharing my love for our history. I am bound to be wrong. Please fact check me in the comments. Please share any narratives in the comments, but please don't take my word for anything. With that being said, I do want to uh, cite my sources. So I referenced Blind Dweller, Great Art Explained, Nerd Writer, The Canvas, all the great YouTube art essay channels. I really enjoy those. And also um, an article called The Witches of Goya by Carmen Fernandez Salvador, incredible article. And then also I referenced my notes from college. I took a whole course on Goya in college as part of my Spanish minor. And so I went back on those notes. That was kind of cool to do. Uh, cause that's obviously all still true and still relevant. So those are my sources. And if I get anything wrong, anything wrong, then just it's their fault probably. Cause I could never do anything wrong. So that being said, I also do want to point out that I have on my, um, rockstar girlfriend makeup and I will make a tutorial about this. I found it on TikTok and then I look so beautiful cause you bitches have been begging me to do downturn eye makeup and I finally did it and I'm kind of obsessed. <laughs> So without further ado, I also have my laptop here, so I'm gonna be referencing some notes. So Stanley, put some stuff on the screen to cover my face when I'm reading. <laughs> Thank you so much, okay. Hey y'all, really quick, I just need to thank the sponsor of today's video, okay? It's SeatGeek, you know them, you love them. And with over 28 million downloads, hey, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app and it doesn't get much better than that. There's over 70,000 different events on SeatGeek every single day from sports to concerts to festivals to more. I recently used the SeatGeek app to help me find tickets to the Rosalia Motomami World Tour and yes, I did pee myself. Thank you for asking. She is such a performer. She is she is a performer. And I got the tickets on SeatGeek, so thank you, SeatGeek. I mean, artists like Bad Bunny, Harry Styles, Carol G, literally everyone. It's so easy, just get your tickets, go. They always wanna make sure you're getting a good deal. So when you're on the app, look for the green dots. That means good deal. Red dots mean bad deal. Every ticket is backed by their buyer guarantee. And SeatGeek is the only app that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. And you know, I've got a code for you. It wouldn't mean integration without one. Use my code BROSKI for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Now, listen to that. That is $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase with code BROSKI. So make sure you click the link in the description to download the app and get to listening. Live music's back, baby. Thanks, BROSKI Nation. At ease. So I do want to give a brief intro to who Goya was, if you're not familiar. Okay, so Francisco José de Goya y Lucientes was considered a romantic painter. And this isn't romantic in the sense of love and romance. This was part of the romanticism movement, meaning um, full of European ideas and virtues. Romanticism was a movement characterized by the emotion of the artist and the subject matter. Um, things like the sublime, which is, we see a lot of sprawling landscapes of these like epic mountains and cliffs and trees with like humans being very small. That's a very romantic element. And the movement really was characterized by showing the emotion that the artist had towards the subject matter versus uh, realism, that realism came later. He was born in 1748 in Aragon, España, and he was a royal court painter. So he did a lot of royal portraiture for the royal families through the years. It, it ascended through a lot of 
different families. Well, not families, but the same lineage, you know what I mean? He became a painter for the Spanish crown in 1786. And a few years later in 1793, he suffered an undiagnosed illness that for some reason left him deaf in both of his ears. And at this point in Goya's life, we really see a shift. His life is pre and post illness. And a big motif in Goya's life and Goya's work for anyone that studies Goya or is familiar with Goya at all is this transition from light to dark, both in the subject matter he painted, in the ways that he painted, in his thoughts, in the things that began to intrigue him, and where his mind went. So that's a big, I feel like that kind of characterizes Goya's life is, is this transition from light to dark. Around this time as well, he stopped painting for the royal court and moved out to a farmhouse in the countryside that was actually nicknamed La Quinta del Sordo, which is the deaf man's house, because the previous tenant was also a deaf man. And around this time, like I said, Goya locks himself in this farmhouse and just begins the descent into madness. He loses his mind and it shows in a lot of his paintings. Some of the paintings that we'll, I'll talk about later were found on the walls of his farm home unnamed, not dated. These are just guesses that art historians have, have come up with of when exactly they were painted, the versions underneath, the topical portions of the paintings, and they were everywhere and they were huge. So, <laughs> so Goya's life was bookmarked by two major historical events, which one was the Spanish Inquisition, which if you did not study the Spanish Inquisition during world history or European history in high school, I'll give you a short little brief summary, but my God, uh, I would really re recommend watching like a crash course on it or something. Uh, shout out to the Green Brothers. I love you guys because what a dark time, what a dark time in human history. So it's bookmarked by the Spanish Inquisition and the Peninsular War, which was Napoleon's takeover of Spain at the time. So these are two major historical events in Goya's life that really shape, along with the deafness, his view on life and his worldview. So he went from naturalistic royal portraiture to the horrors of war. He kind of turned into a, a little political painter and then just his descent into madness. So to see this transition is just truly incredible how you can see it with Picasso as well, his descent into just like this almost different person at, at this point, you know, the blue period versus the cubism, like versus all of that to see how he has changed along with his artistic style has changed is really cool. I've always said art history is human history. It's a beautiful example of how we as ourselves change and how history changes us. So it's cool. So around this time, probably up until about 1834 is when the Spanish Inquisition ended, we see a lot of social and political upheaval in Spain and Goya is there for all of it. The church had a complete control of literature, censorship, what art was and wasn't acceptable. This control that the church had really dragged Spain back to the medieval ages and Goya really was disturbed by this idea because at this time the enlightenment was going on in the rest of Western Europe and these beautiful liberal ideas were being thrown around and freedom of expression and different art movements were happening everywhere. And here we have Spain just ca being cast back into the dark ages by the church and by the church's need for control. So we have Napoleon invades Spain, takes over, crowns himself, whatever. I don't know if it was emperor or king at the time. And Goya actually remained in Spain during the French occupation. And he was religious to a certain extent, but he also had incredibly liberal political views. And it hurt him to see Spain be left behind while the rest of Europe was so intellectually developed and, and was developing. He attacked the ignorance that plagued his society that he grew up in and he was seeing revert back. And superstition was a big part of that, that plagued this society, this obsession with what goes bump in the night and witches and the devil and sacrificing babies and all of this sort of the extremities of the occult and what the occult is stereotypically known for. Just the public's ignorance to what that is and how it was used as a fear mongering technique and all that, Goya just saw through it all. You know, he was up here and the rest of the Spanish population were down here. Now, I don't want to gloss over his incredibly complex and interesting life, but for the sake of this YouTube video, I do want to focus on about four or five different specific works that I find really interesting. And again, to answer the question of why was he obsessed with this iconography of 
witches and goats and just the occult in general. And it's not as straightforward as you would think. There are a lot of layers to why he did this and why he chose this. What, what was plaguing his mind where he had to get this out on canvas, you know what I mean? So again, if you're interested in Goya's life or anything like that, I urge you to read about it. There are plenty of YouTube videos on Goya as an artist, his incredibly complex life. No, that's not what this video is. So just don't pester me about it. So back to Goya's illness, because this really is a turning point in his life. He was undergoing a nervous breakdown and entering a prolonged physical illness and admitted that the works from this time were created to reflect his own self-doubt anxiety and fear that he himself was going mad. Goya wrote that the work served to occupy his imagination, tormented as it is by contemplation of his sufferings. <laughs> Me too. It was a somber vision of human bodies without human reason. And this quote references one of his works called Yard with Lunatics. And this was kind of the turning point of you know, he's starting to paint incredibly dark subject matter. This actually, sadly enough, was a scene that he recalled from his youth of an asylum in Faragotha that he saw as a young boy of just how cruel, I mean, if you think about asylum patients in the 50s and 60s, in this time, you know, where homosexuality was still considered a mental illness, how awful these patients were treated at these facilities, think about and the early 1800s, dude. It was just barbaric, it was inhumane, and it was it, it was animalistic almost, is, is sometimes how Goya would describe it. We start to see a lot of shadows in his work at this time. We go from these beautiful, glossy, bright, royal portraiture to shadowy figures and etchings and sketches, which shadows represent ignorance and how these people get left behind in society. And when you do that, you know, when some of the population can't read, you are falling behind as a society. He was trying to convey a bleak and pitiless view of humanity. Los Caprichos were etchings and sketches that highlighted the ignorance of an unenlightened society and what happens when you are shielded from the rest of the world and the development of the rest of the Western world by the church. These were satirical political pieces as well, which I love a good satire. I love a good satire piece. The targets of this political satire were superstitious peasants, prostitutes, which is ignorance of the lower classes, the Catholic church, how dangerous and how silly it was, as well as man's inhumanity to humanity, how we can be so incredibly cruel to each other, just unimaginably cruel. And I'll get into it later with the Spanish Inquisition. We also see at this time a struggle between reason and imagination. I'm sure you've seen this etching, El Sueño de la... <laughs> Me. I'm sure you've seen this etching, El Sueño de la Razón Produce Monstruos. This is super famous. Uh, with all the bats above it and he's dreaming. This is the sleep of reason produces monsters. So we see this war of the reasonable logical mind with the imagination and how terrifying the human imagination can be. And then there are the black paintings, Las Pinturas Negras. Uh, from 1819 to 1823, this is when he's in La Quinta del Sordo. And the names are unofficial. Like I said, he didn't title these works himself. They were hanging on the walls of his farm home and they were then transferred to canvas to be put in museums. So let's talk about the question. What is up with all the scary figures in Goya's works? Well, a lot of them, like I've been mentioning, were political commentary. They were meant to scare the lower classes. They were meant to make fun of the stupidity while also knowing that, you know, deep down as a religious person, this is scary iconography and he knew what he was doing. Okay, so let's get into the first painting that I want to talk about, which is El Gran Cabron. If you speak Spanish, cabron means asshole or friend, <laughs> depending on how you use it. But that is not the meaning in this sense. It is the great he goat. And in a lot of art history, the goat represents the devil because it's scary as f and also culturally it, it represents evil and the devil. So the other name for this is a Basque word, um, el aquelarre, and please 
Forgive me, I don't speak Catalan. If that's Catalan, I don't know. Anyway, this was a, a city where alleged sexual orgies went on, where everyone had sex with the devil and then each other and then drank each other's blood and sacrificed babies and drank the baby's blood. I mean, it was a real good time. But this was, you know, the lore of what these devil worshipers were doing. So of course he painted it. So I wanna take a look at this. Look at the distorted faces in the background the long horizontal format, very dark, very creepy. It just keeps going almost. You know, it's like how big were these gatherings? How many people were involved? Now the goat in the middle, like we've talked about before is Satan. He is the star taking the mortal form of a goat hulking in the moonlight over a coven of what we think are witches. The submissive positioning of the witches around the goat also lends you know, itself to the explanation that this is Satan. The goat is wearing a ceremonial black robe. And the thing about this is evil isn't depicted, it's implied. If you look at this, it's a picture of a goat in a robe and people. You know, that's, it's silly, if anything. The evil is implied with historical context, with the knowledge that this is satirical. This is making fun of the idiot masses while the idiot masses see this and they're like, oh my God, you know, it's all very, it's implied. And with that implication, you know, it's always this question of what's scarier, the truth or the human imagination? And there are a couple ways to answer that, but I think the human imagination always jumps to extremities and the unknown is the most terrifying thing versus, you know, if it came out Let's say the devil put out a news post and was like, yeah, I do. I do sacrifice babies. I do enjoy drinking baby blood. We'd be like, oh, it's messed up. But it wouldn't be that shocking, you know, the unknown. I think that's what really scares the shit out of us as humans is just not knowing. So again, this canvas is a social commentary on the insanity of the superstitious times in which he lived, which was yet another way the Catholic Church controlled the worldview of its subjects through fear mongering and tall tales of midnight gatherings of witches summoning the devil. You know, all these, we still see this today. I mean, these are used to control the ignorant religious populations of rural communities. Las pinturas negras were really protesting the values of the Spanish Inquisition, which was incredibly brave at the time. Next, we can talk about the witch's Sabbath, which is another very similar piece of work, but a little different. So this one was commissioned by the Duchess of Osuna. So if we look at this immediately, the bats in the air, the dark priest-like goat in full detail. This is a little brighter than the last one, uh, but still it's even scarier seeing their faces and seeing the goat's face. So he's reaching out to a woman holding a healthy looking baby, but under it, look at all the emaciated and dead babies on the floor. And on the left, we see the three babies hung by their neck on a stake. So this is the question of, was he exploring the way in which superstition had such a grip on the common people? Or was this more of an allegory, allegory to his life? Goya fathered seven children in his lifetime and only I think one of them lived. So some art historians think that this is a reference to that, all the corpses on the floor. You know, was this a commentary on his life and just the devastation, grief and loss and stupidity of grief and loss that he dealt with in his lifetime. Is this what's depicted here? Or is this just, you know, again, making fun of the superstitious? Now this is kind of tea. Let's look at the horns on the devil figure. These are fig leaves, maybe, on his head, which historically have been used to cover genitals in classic art. Think you know, Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. There's an implication of the sexual nature of the devil and his followers, but I don't know about all that because this is just a theory I read. I think that that's tea, if so. Um, or this could just be, what's the word for what the Roman, what Roman, uh, the Roman, um, um, Siri, can you, um, a laurel wreath. I uh, love Google. Yeah, some people think it's a laurel wreath. I, that could be true. I don't know. I mean, if we're thinking of this goat man as the devil, then of course he is king of hell. He is king of the underworld. So that very much could be some form of a crown. I think that it's, it's this whole sexual thing that's implied is more tea. It's more tea. Okay, yo quiero enfocarnos en algunas pinturas específicas como, como el vuela de brujas. For example, this is the witch's flight. We see in this painting immediately, scary, scary, scary. Underneath two men terrified, 
one of them covering his ears and eyes with a hood, holding out what we think to be a protective hand gesture. And again, I went into a rabbit hole. What does what does this mean? Something about um, the clit. <laughs> Don't know. Um, this was meant to be a protective hand gesture to ward against evil. I don't know what it has to do with the vagina, but hey. The donkey on the lower right hand corner, Goya did this a lot in his paintings. The depiction of a donkey represents stupidity. The ass, if you will. It represents stupidity. And in any painting around this time that you see, that kind of is, you know, that's how you know it's kind of like, you're dumb, satire, I am being a goofy goofster. So let's move up to the top. The, these are three witches. These three witches have kidnapped a naked man. It appears that they're feasting on him. But look at the positioning of the mouths. They appear more erotic than cannibalistic, I think. And so this is also a commentary on the sexually dominant woman must be a witch. TikTok would agree but I disagree. This was a, a commentary on the time. You know, women, prostitution was rampant at this time because poverty, because of the state of Spain in this time period. And it's really unfortunate, you know, while the rest of Europe was experiencing this sort of neo-Renaissance, Spain was left behind. And this was unfortunately the viewpoint or, or opinion that a lot of people held. So if we look a little closer, the witches have shaved heads and are wearing corozas, which are pointy hats that men and women during the Inquisition would have to wear when they were arrested as a form of public humiliation. Now, what were they arrested for? Mm, not being Catholic or being accused of not being Catholic or being accused of knowing someone who isn't Catholic. This was all the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, so this coroza or forgive me, cap capirote, which is another word for just the hat, the triangle hat, was worn during the session of an auto de fe, which was a public trial. Listen to how absurd. Listen to how, listen to how. The auto de fe was a public trial where the accused sentences were read and then the respective punishment was administered publicly. The color of each corotha was di different depending on the accused crime. People who were condemned to be executed wore a red corotha. Other punishments used different colors. These corothas have flames, which means they were condemned as witches and were to be burned at the stake. The depiction and characterization of women as witches is a an attempt to neutralize women's power when it appears as a threat to the established order of the patriarchy. I also want to credit that sentence to Carmen Fernandez Salvador, who I mentioned in the beginning of this video. This article was incredible. I mean, just, I was reading and I was like, Exa exactly, oh my God, exactly. So good. Okay, so this is the moment in time where buckle up, we're having a history lesson, okay? I've kind of alluded to it, but I really wanna get into the severity, the depravity, and the absolute terror that the Spanish Inquisition rained down on the people of Spain. It was horrifying. If you wanted to live in Spain, at this time, you had to be Catholic, period. No ifs, and or buts about it. If you weren't, or if it was rumored, you could be practicing another religion by activities like, for example, refusing to eat pork, which is common in the Islamic faith and um, in Judaism, you were brought in for questioning. Your neighbor could report you if they saw you not partaking in a feast where pork was served. And after this questioning, you would be subsequently, usually tortured. Many Catholics of the time were unhappy with the church's abuses of power and problematic Catholic dogma. Neighbors were encouraged to alert the church of any heretics in their neighborhood as well, creating distrust within the community. So not only is the church turning on its people, neighbors are turning on its its own people. Neighbors are turning on their neighbors. This was also used as a form of revenge on neighbors. If something happened between you and a neighbor or you wanna date your, you wanna marry your neighbor's wife, accuse the other husband of being a heretic, he's brought in for questioning, tortured and killed, you can marry his wife now. I mean, come on now, they got real inventive. It all boils down to threatening the power and influence and authority that the church held at the time. They were instilling medieval fear in a modernized society. What we're dealing with and talking about here is theocratic absolutism. Hey, I can't think of anything scarier in my mind. The goal was to drive out heresy by the use of specially trained priests who were called inquisitors. They were to discover heresy and extract penance and confession from heretics, regardless of if it was true or not. This was a quote from Pope Innocent III. Anyone who attempts to construe a personal view of God which conflicts with church dogma must be burned without pity. 
not to get too graphic, but it, I feel like it's important to understand for the world Goya lived in at the time. I want to paint a more accurate picture so these paintings make more sense. If you were accused of heresy, you're brought in for questioning and subsequently torture. They were whipped with bull whips, inlaid with metal shards, and if the victim didn't die from the torture itself, they likely died from infection because the wounds were so deep. You did not need proof of heresy. This was a guilty until proven innocent sort of situation, which is unfathomable, <laughs> unfathomable. It was a political solution to the ethnic cleansing that the Spanish government and church wanted, which was to rid its kingdom of its Jewish, Muslim, gay, rational, scientifically inclined populations, any of the above. This was their political solution. It was meant to get rid of otherwise undesirable populations through a holy premise. The last execution of the Inquisition was in Spain in 1826. This was the execution by garroting of the school teacher Cayetano Ripoll for re purportedly teaching deism in his school. In Spain, the practices of the Inquisition were finally outlawed in 1834. So it's important to understand this was the context, this was the world in which Goya lived. The outrage and confusion with the world that he had hope for and the contrast of the world that he lived in really is shown in some of these paintings. Let's move on to another one. El Conjuro, the spell. So this is a painting of a man in a dream. We can only gather. The man in the white shirt, this is his dream. And once again, we see incredibly horrifying iconography of baby stealing witches, bones, flames, voodoo dolls. The spirit materializing in the sky is holding what we think is two human thigh bones. So this is again, commentary on what could come if you did not live by the standards and the rules of the church at the time and the absolute fear mongering that was the result or was the, I guess, intention. There are so many more works. There's so many more periods. There are so many more collections of works. So to come back to the question at hand, which is why the scary iconography? Why was he so tortured? There were so many things at play, but I think it really boils down to he was disappointed he was disappointed with the society in which he lived. He saw so much hope and so much potential for the enlightenment and for what art and literature and academia could be. And it's unfortunate that he didn't get to experience that. That coupled with his deafness, his isolation, his fear of going mad. Seeing how the world and how the church and how medicine treated clinically insane people at the time or anything adjacent to that, was utterly terrifying. I think he really had a fear of what were to happen if he lost his wits. That anxiety mixed with the fear, mixed with losing one of your main senses, I can't imagine. So all of this really lends itself to the subject matter that he chose to paint. And it's incredibly interesting and fun to research. I had a blast Googling this and, and there is a movie called Goya's Ghosts I would really recommend. Javier Bardem is in it, Natalie Portman's in it. Great movie. Uh, Goya's, Goya's incredibly interesting and what a man, what an artist and what a reflection of a dark time. So yeah, thank you guys so much for listening. If I left anything out, sorry, but I hit on some of my favorite Goya pieces. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I love you so much and think that that's it. I love you guys very much and thank you for watching and listening to me ramble. And thank you to Stanley for editing this video. And thank you to SeatGeek for sponsoring this video. Goodbye.